It's Thursday, September 3rd, 2020, just after market close in New York. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, we have a special show. Due to the volatility in markets, we have two guests, Dave Floyd, founder of Aspen Trading, and then Real Vision's managing editor, Roger Hurst, talking about the day's events. Dave, thanks for joining us. We're sorry to pull you away from your terminal on this day, but we're happy to have you here. Hey, I really appreciate it, Ash. Uh, the timing timing couldn't have been better to have me back. I mean, it's a it's a barn burner of a day for sure in the markets. Yeah, we're recording here about ten minutes uh, away from market close Eastern time. Dave, mm-hmm. tell us what are you looking at today amid all of this volatility? Well, obviously, like most people, the front and center thing is on the S and P five hundred or maybe the Nasdaq, depending on your indice of choice. But on a day where you're off about four percent. I think we're down about four and a quarter percent, maybe at the worst on the S and P. Uh, that gets people's attention. However, I, I always try to temper it in in this environment because inevitably these dips get bought, and um, I'm still kind of going with that game plan. That doesn't mean I'm throwing my neck out on the line right now, but we're trading down at thirty four thirty, and like you said, we got about ten minutes to go. Um, for me, thirty four thirty represents, you know, it might be a sticky area in terms of some support maybe down to 34.13. Um, you know, worst case scenario, at least in the near term, and I'm not really trying to look out much beyond tomorrow because we have the non-farm payrolls report. Yeah. You know, maybe we head down to 33.86, 33.66. Those are kind of the levels I'm looking at. I don't think I'd be a seller at these levels. We've just come too far. Maybe I'm an opportunistic buyer tomorrow, but you know, I, I move in and out of the S&Ps on occasion. I'll, I'll usually translate that type of a, a move in the S and P's into some related market. You know, for for me today, most of my moves were in FX. You know, I, I wanted to be long the dollar today. That was my game plan coming in even before the S and P's cratered. So you know, I kind of got lucky today. The setup was there. I took the setup, and then boom, S and P's fell out of bed. Um, tomorrow's going to be pretty instrumental, though. I mean, maybe the non-farm payroll just becomes kind of a big dud. And technically, it's the last day tomorrow for the summer. Everybody will be leaving earlier after that non-farm payroll, get that Labor Day weekend in, and then back to the back to what I suspect is going to be a pretty active fall next week after Labor Day. Yeah. You know, Dave, you brought us up to date on what your thinking is right now, short-term tactically with this market. Let's zoom the camera out a little bit. What's the mm-hmm. framework? What's the thesis been uh, since, let's say, uh, the beginning of the COVID epidemic in March? How have you been thinking about these markets? <laughs> Very differently at different points in time. Uh, I'll be the first to admit, like many of my other colleagues uh, that will line up aside of me. I mean, frankly, a lot of it was quite surprising. Um, Wasn't expecting such a robust move off the lows. But again, that just goes to show you what a market dynamic that combines Federal Reserve, you know, with a very loose monetary policy and let's say a structural change in the markets, which is you know the rise of indexation, and and then the third component is through you know through every rational reason you can think of is that you know those that are let's say forty and younger or maybe in their thirties and younger they've all they've known as ever is to buy the dips and nobody can tell them that they're wrong because they've been proven time and time again so. I was, no doubt about it, caught flat-footed. I didn't think we would come back to new highs at all. So my view changed quite a bit. Now, where do I see it now, you know, where we were and where we're going? You know, I think the dollar's probably tapped out to the downside, just sentiment got blown out to the downside. Commercial traders are, yeah, commercial traders are now kind of net long. So I'm not sure I addressed all of that question, but I'll be the first to admit, COVID caught me off guard after, not not the initial thrust lower, that was fun to trade, but afterward I was surprised by the move up. Yeah. And this this recent continued rise up is, you know, by and large, you, you stay on the sidelines because there's not a lot, of, a lot of reference points. So maybe we'll start to get that with prices coming back in a little bit here. Yeah. Well, if you buy stocks on your iPhone, they can't go down. That's yeah, that seems to be the prevailing logic. And in all fairness, that has worked. Um, but you know what? I've been in the industry a long time. I started trading in 1995. I traded through the 1999-2000 nonsense. And at that time, I was a prop trader. 
Brenda was a trader on my own desk and we had a bunch of guys with us. And I remember just sitting there on many days and wondering why I wasn't making as much money as everybody else, because I couldn't quite connect the dots as to why I should be buying Cisco and then go surfing for the afternoon and then come back and sell it. That never really registered with me. But (laughs) in the end, the music stopped. There was only a few seats left. I happened to be one of the ones that grabbed a seat because at some point this will end. It will end badly. And I'm not trying to be a doom and gloomer, but the, the fact of the matter is there is a disconnect right now. And, you know, at some point there'll be some sort of a news event or exogenous shock that will knock this market down a little bit and maybe put us into a slightly more, you know, logical trading environment. Right. You know, you've been trading these markets for a long time. When you think about the dot-com bubble, when you look at 2008, 2009, and now we look at COVID, is this something that you feel kind of rhymes with that? Is there a is there a meta lesson, a theme that you bring across? Well, no doubt. I mean, like they say, history maybe doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. This one rhymes without a doubt. Um, what's different for me this time is that I'm not actively looking to call the top. I mean, I, I, I'd be a fool and anybody who tries to call the top, you might get lucky, but you know, it's a one in a thousand chance. What I'm doing is I'm just simply going along with what's happening in a very measured, very tactical um, uh, way so that I'm, I'm kind of nibbling as prices move higher, I'm nibbling as prices move lower, and I'm not trying to make any grand bets. At some point, it will unravel. I don't know when that could be. It could be next year for all I know, and frankly, I don't care, but I suspect at some point it will unravel. In the meantime, that doesn't mean you sit, you sit tight. There are opportunities. You just got to divorce. You got to leave your opinion at home when you come to the when you come in to trade in the morning, you just simply need to trade what's on your screen because that's all you can really trade. That's the final judge, and that's price action. Yeah. So when you look at the entire constellation of tradable securities, you're nibbling on the way up, you're nibbling on the way down. How do you think about that? How do you screen and how do you pick the particular securities that you want to get involved with? Well, I've been talking quite a bit about this over the last couple of days as being part of the the festival of learning here at Real Vision. And we've had a lot of good questions that are exactly in that wheelhouse. For me, it's always been a, uh, about focusing on on a few select names. I did that when I was a prop trader, as I was talking about back in the in the 90s and into the early 2000s. I, I would just trade one, maybe two names at a time, day in, day out. I basically do the same thing now. I I keep a very limited focus. I trade the S&Ps, I trade a lot of 10-year notes, and then I trade a handful of the G10 currencies, You know, mainly Euro, Aussie, Kiwi, Euro, Sterling. So that's where I keep my universe. So what what makes that manageable is that one, you get to kind of know it. You understand kind of the nuances and the intricacies of it. But it allows me at the end of the day to basically go and look at the charts and know where my levels are. It's, it's not an exhaustive process where I'm trying to find the needle in the haystack. So when I wrap up my call here and then do my you know, prep work for tomorrow, I might spend 10 or 15 minutes looking at those individual securities, just like I did last night, knowing that I wanted to be short the New Zealand dollar. I knew I wanted to be short um, uh, Aussie dollar, and I wanted to be short uh, Canada Japanese yen. So it's just a matter of finding the the securities that that you want to trade. You know, for me, you know what they are and then finding the levels where you want to be uh, where you want to be involved and then let the process, you know, take care of itself. Basically, get out of the way, do the work, get out of the way, manage the trade effectively. Yeah. And Dave, what is it that made you select those particular uh, those particular securities? Is it liquidity? Is it market depth? What is it are the parameters or the the um, the features that make those desirable for you to be in and to take this strategy there? Well, by and large, um, they're more a function of my temperament. Um, you know, the, do I trade the S&Ps? Yeah, on occasion. But to be honest, they're a little too manic for me. Um, I like 10-year notes. And, you know, most people would, you know, they'd have a big yawn or they'd fall asleep. And, yeah, they do move at a glacial pace. But when they move, they move very, you know, intentionally and deliberately. And, you know, if you put on decent size, you can get really good returns in them. But the, to answer the other part of your question, you know, looking at notes, looking at the G10, and then occasionally looking at, let's say, gold and silver when they become active, there's a mosaic that can be constructed. They're, they're all interconnected on some level. So if right. you know what's happening in the rates market, you can make a fair assessment of what might be happening in dollar yen at any given point in time. 
or it then allows you to maybe look at some of the ancillary markets that that drive these things like FX options, you know, um, risk reversal. So by keeping that focus narrow, you can kind of broaden the, the the depth of your research on those individual securities. But for me, it was really more about I like the way they trade, and they're all basically large kind of macro oriented. Um, trading vehicles, even though I'm not taking a macro view, they are by and large moving based on what's happening in the market at large. Right. So with that as prologue, with that as the setup, what are you seeing right now today? We've just, uh, I think we're at the close right now. It's about uh, 3.59 PM. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you seeing right now on your screen? Well, seeing the S&Ps bounce back, uh, although they've bounced back down a couple of times since we've been on, but by and large, the S&Ps look a little tapped out right now. So, you know, maybe if you were a nibbler down at that 34.30 area, you, you might be in good shape here. The main thing, yeah, there's the bell. There it is. Um, the, the main thing I know that stood out for me today, and I'm, I'm short 10-year notes, and um, we're basically short from just a little bit worse prices than here. We're at 139.22. My average entry is around 139.18. So, But what the thing I noticed about today that I'm really keen on is that S&Ps got spanked. 10-year notes didn't really rally that much. They're up a tenth of a percent. So this kind of fits into my overall thesis that we're going to see higher rates, lower note prices going forward. So I'm, I remain very comfortable being short 10-year notes. Um, I think the other thing that's on my screen is that I think we're going to get a little bit of a pause in the dollar. We've rallied nicely this week. Again, relative to what we've come down, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. But I do think we're in the process of carving out a low on the dollar. Um, Therefore, we'll probably see the euro rally back up a little bit. I got some notes here. I'll probably be looking at the euro, maybe selling some rallies uh, right up to around maybe 119, 119 and a quarter. Yeah, that was my level, 119, 119 and a quarter. I think the euro will probably stall out there. So in terms of like looking ahead to tomorrow, see what happens with 10-year notes. I wouldn't be surprised if they... They took a little bit of a hit to the downside, and I wouldn't be surprised if the euro rallied a little bit, but I would use that as an opportunity to establish some shorts going into next week when I think things are going to be more active as people come back from summer vacations, the institutional flow comes back into the market, and we get a little bit more of a deliberate price action. So it's going to be an extremely interesting you know, September. I mean, to, if, if we got the action we saw today in August, it's going to be pretty interesting come September. And, you know, here we are, 34.62 now on the S&Ps. I mean, they're just, it's insane. That's a 32-point that's a move in the three minutes you and I have been talking since I last looked. Crazy. Yeah, a great time to be having this conversation. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, again, there are opportunities out there. Um, just be careful because things are moving quite a bit. Always, you know, pick your spots, know where you're going to get out, size your trade properly. If you can, if you can do those three things, you know you'll you'll keep yourself out of the big harm, so to speak. You'll yeah. take some losses here and there, but you'll get some winners. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting um, day tomorrow. Probably even um, may, maybe even interesting in the evening session. But tomorrow with the NFP report and then heading into next week, it's going to be a lot to talk about for you guys at Real Vision over those several days. Yeah, for sure. Dave, you mentioned sizing. How do you think about sizing during periods of volatility like this? Does it change the strategy? Yeah. You know, for me, no, it doesn't. Uh, I love the volatility. That's where I tend to thrive. Um, now, again, I'm not taking longer term bets where that volatility would really work against me if I'm wrong. I'm a, I'm a tactical trader. So um, I'm, I'm usually full in when it's like this, meaning I'll, I'll hit my maximum risk exposure on a per trade basis because that volatility actually works to my advantage if I can get my timing right. And, you know, historically speaking, you know, 2000 through 2001, 2008, those are the periods where guys like me can tend to flourish quite a bit because you're getting that really, really steady, you know, movement of prices up and down and, and it's easier to take advantage of that. So I want to be fully positioned when I'm trading in this type of an environment. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the 10 year note. Do you have a, a target uh, in the short term on yields? Uh, high conviction around the correlation between the 10 year uh, and US equity markets? Or does that just not line up with the way you think about markets? No, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think the thing that you, you bring out, there's one, one thing that I've been kind of hanging my hat on from a quantitative standpoint is that 
during the summer, we saw a 70% correlation of the S&Ps and 10-year notes. They're both going up in tandem, which historically has happened in the past. But when it's happened and got to that level, the forward returns on 10-year notes, it's not that, it's not that, the, not that their performance in isolation was bad, but they definitely lagged or they were an underperformer relative to the S&Ps. So when I take that piece of data and I look at my charts where I'm already bearish, meaning I'm expecting higher rates and lower note prices, I'm using that piece of quantitative data to know, okay, you know, in terms of a repeatable pattern in history, which is not very often that you get repeatable patterns, but when you get one, you, know, you put that into your checkbox and you say, you know what? Now I'm even more confident that I want to be short 10-year notes. Now I just got to pick my levels and, and get involved when I can. So what does that mean for the rate? I mean, I think we get above three quarters of a percent, maybe up to 0.8. You know, we, we could retest three, but that's getting that's getting too far ahead for me. The main level I'm looking at right now is if we can get below, let's say, 138.29, 138.25, which is a whole handle down from here. I, I see the potential for a little bit of a flush lower and that, you know, could be another point. So, you know, two points in the treasury market, that that's a big move and may not happen overnight, but it, I think once we get below 138.25, I think you could see some, you, for, from a notes perspective, a kind of an accelerated move lower. Dave, what else are you looking at? <laughs> well, you know, Ash, you know, a lot of people always ask me that. And the fact is I, I try to stick with what I trade, you know, I'm not trading Tesla. You know, I'm not trading Zoom or Peloton or, or things like that. That just gets a little bit out of my wheelhouse. You know, everybody's gravitated towards the razzle dazzle. And I, I get it. We're human beings, but I don't know. You know, the SPs are razzle dazzle, but when you go in and try to trade them, it's like chasing jello around a dinner plate. You know, you, you think you got it and it scoots out the other way. So um I I just like to keep an eye on what I know and what I know really well. I've always found, at least in my observations, that when I see people getting bored with what they're doing and looking to see what their neighbors are doing or what they're what the trader down the street's doing, that's when you're getting into the into the deep end of the pool and you're dealing with a lot of unknowns that you can't put your put your hand on. So much of being a successful trader or an investor is the nuance in the experience. And that only comes from taking your reps. I mean, I look at 10-year notes every day. I look at the euro every day, every single day. So when things happen, every once in a while, things you'll just have this, this you know, aha moment where, you know, I was already going to get short the euro, but I'm like, you know what? Now it's time to do it now. And you can't put your finger on it. There's no equation that ar helped you arrive at that. So I just think it's important to stick with what you know. If, you're, if you trade Tesla and that's all you trade, fantastic. You're probably killing it. But I think if you just show up and try to trade a stock just because it's moving all over the place, it's not as easy as it seems. Well said. Dave, your final thoughts as we head into tomorrow amid all of this volatility into non-farm payroll day. Well, certainly with on the heels of today's volatility, tomorrow's NFP could add another healthy dose of it. And then, um, you know, even if we kind of knew what the number was going to be, you know, we never know how the market will react. So it's anybody's guess. Normally, you know, the Friday ahead of Labor Day, you know, after the first hour or two of trading, everybody hits the, you know, hits the hits the road. Today, tomorrow might be a little bit different. Who knows? Maybe people will hang around if there's a lot of volatility. But in my in my experience, you know, you get out of Dodge after that first hour on a Friday and um, come back on Tuesday, in this case, uh, Labor Day, um, come back fresh and ready to hit it hard. Dave, really interesting stuff. Thanks for joining us on this very volatile day when I'm sure you had a lot going on. You'll have to come back and do this again. Absolutely. My pleasure, Ash. Really enjoyed it. We're now joined by Roger Hurst. This was filmed today around 2.15 p.m. Eastern time in the middle of the afternoon trading, but we wanted to give you a sense of Roger's context for this market rally and some of the broader themes and issues that he's been thinking about. Roger Hurst, thank you for joining us. Hi, how's it going? It's going well. You know, Roger, we appreciate you rearranging your schedule. Markets are in motion right now. Nobody would rather talk to than you. What are you looking at today? Well, it's um, it kind of goes to something that I mentioned or talked about in um, the piece that I do for Affinity, which came out yesterday, where um, in the second part called The Chatter, we talked about, or I talked about how there's some incredible, in fact, sensational sort of technicals. Today, we have a large number of technical factors that are screaming for a reversal. 
Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be a major pullback, you know, one that's a, a big bear market, but it does increase the asymmetric risk of a downside air pocket. Now, timing is, is everything and nearly always accident. It's just that that program goes out on a Wednesday every week. So it just happened to be that I'd written it for that. But the previous week, we'd also talked about um, the data usage um, within Refinitiv had fallen off a cliff in August compared to the previous three years. So this was generally a, an era or a period where there was very, very or far, far fewer traders at their desks. And what we're basically saying is there is this risk that we get an air pocket in markets. Doesn't mean we get a, a bear market or a major reversal. You could have the sudden sharp pullbacks from the highs. Right. Um, but the other thing I've been talking about is, is also this, this kind of weird volatility world that we're in, which I think is, is, is exceptional in many, many ways. Yeah. And just for reference, uh, we're filming this now around 2.15 p.m. Eastern time, uh, S&P 500 uh, off about three and a half percent down to 34.55 as of the time of this taping uh, and NASDAQ off almost five percent. And it's very reminiscent of a pullback that we had in June. Remember, we had that incredible rally and then we had a two, three day pullback. So at the moment, you'd say it's more reminiscent of that than anything else. You get the trend. The trend gets overbought, the trend gets overabused, and then it has an air pocket. Very, very normal in these sorts of circumstances. Timing it is almost impossible, but you know, we were on guard for this because there was a whole bunch of indicators out there which said, you know, there's something very, very unusual here. Yeah. Roger, you've been thinking about this very deeply and thinking about it for a long time, about the change in dynamics in these markets. Active monitors no longer a driving force. Fundamentals, uh, we've just come unmoored. Talk a little bit about the flow and sentiment component of this market from your perspective. Well, I would say that this market hasn't been fundamentally driven for at least five years. And you can see that if you have a, if you look at things like profits on the S&P have been flatlining for five years. Um, in fact, they've obviously plummeted in the last um, couple of quarters. But at the same time, the S&P has been going higher and higher and higher. So it's been massively divorced. And the thing is that we, you know, myself, yourself, probably a lot of people of our generation are still anchored in a world which is driven or where the majority player was the active manager. So fundamentals were the drivers of the market. But for the last five years, at least, the drivers of the market have been flows. And today, the drivers of the market are retail, who are driven by sentiment, um, probably media stories. That's driven by the 401ks and the rules-based funds, so things like risk parity. So that's flows into pension funds. And it's driven by corporate buybacks. And I know a lot of corporates will no longer be doing buybacks right now, but the tech companies are. And the tech companies are the ones that are leading the charge. This is flow. This is not fundamentals. None of those guys care about earnings per share and PEs. But we use those as our frame of reference. Now, in some ways, you know, we never like to use the phrase, this time is different, because, but I think it's much maligned because actually for five years, this has been different. Doesn't mean it will always be different, but it might be different for a long enough period to carry me out of the market or other people out of the market or for other people to profit from this move. But it's very, very different. And it's driven by a very, very different dynamic to the old world that was certainly pre-2008 and certainly uh, if at the very latest pre-2015. Yeah. So lots to talk about, bonds, euro, volatility. What are you looking at? What is the first gauge on your screen? What are the first three or four gauges on your screen that help you understand what's happening? So last week when I was doing, you know, talking through this, it was the um, incredible move in the VIX versus what the underlying market was doing. So the VIX is implied volatility. It's what people pay for protection before volatility. And it was 25. And we've seen this incredible period recently where the VIX, has been at the highest level it's ever been at. In fact, yesterday, the VIX was at its highest level with an all-time high. We've had about three or four of these in this period where the VIX is at the highest level with an all-time high on the S&P. The only other period was 99 and 2000. But what's difference between, or the difference between now and then is that back then, when you had the VIX at 25, the underlying market was moving with a volatility of 25. We call that historical or realized volatility. Up until yesterday, 10-day realized volatility. So what the S&P was actually doing was at 10. So the S&P was grinding higher and higher and higher, but it was just grinding up. The volatility on the S&P was a bit like this, but the VIX was implying the volatility should be this. So what you saw was options are incredibly expensive. They have really bad value in this market, but people were buying them, but they're ma mainly buying the upside. And one of the great stats that I loved over this two or three week period came from Sentiment Trader, where they said, Let's take puts volume minus call volume, and then we'll 
divided by the total volume on the New York Stock Exchange. And the chart of that looks like Tesla. Basically, it's gone to a new high and a new high and a new high. People have been buying the upside much, much more than, than, than they've been di- buying, buying the downside. So that was one of the reasons why we've seen volatility going up and this massive spread between what the market was doing and what people were prepared to pay. But then the second thing which has also driven this is that volatility has a curve. So you've got spot VIX. You can't trade spot VIX. That's just a number implied from the market. You can trade the front month, the front month futures contracts, and so on. And there's a whole, there's a whole curve of futures contracts. And what we've seen is that the, the US election premium is at record levels. So that, and we've got a chart to show this, the difference between the second contract and the front month contract, the first contract, is the widest it's ever been, at least since 2000, because of this massive bump. And that pulls the whole curve up. So the whole curve has gone up even whilst the underlying was doing nothing. So when you add that, that the VIX is saying the market's quite flighty, even though the market itself is doing nothing and grinding to new highs, people are leveraging into calls, they're not buying the downside. And if you looked at this and said, I want to buy the downside, but I'm paying two, two and a half times the real value of protection, then people don't buy that protection. So that downside looks vulnerable. So these are some of the reasons why this air pocket risk has been building over the last couple of weeks. Again, is also associated with the fact that people have been away from their desks in this holiday period because people have just been fatigued by the markets over the last few months. Yeah. You know, I know you watched RVDB yesterday. Uh, Ed was on fire. He's got a thesis. He's talking about many of the same things that you are, the primacy, the rise uh, of derivatives in terms of in creating volatility in markets. What are your thoughts on that to follow up on some of Ed's points? Well, there's two things at play. So volatility in markets have generally been very, very low. So you've got a low base because what is it the central banks are doing with QE? They're effectively dampening down volatility. FX volatility has been incredibly low. Generally, bond volatility has been low. Equity volatility has been low with these sudden sharp spikes, but then they damp it down. I mean, let's face it, this was the fastest bear market ever. It took, uh, I think, 33 days, business days, to recoup the losses of 35% decline. So central banks don't want volatility. So we're in a world of pent-up volatility because the whole market structure is short vol, which is why central banks ultimately have to rescue the volatility kind of global matrix. But that is the basis that we're in at the moment. And it's, it means that the, and this is the dance of death. Remember at the very beginning, we talked about the dance of death, which is central banks have to decide where they come back in. And I did an interview today, which will come out on uh, Real Vision Plus on Monday with Mahmoud Narani of QI. And we're talking about what are the drivers. And what's fascinating is that there's normally many, many factors that drive a market. At the moment, there's pretty much only one. It's kind of obvious. It's policy. but if yeah, you're looking yeah. at this pullback today, you have to think to yourself, okay, it's a pullback, it's an air pocket, there was lots of technical reasons behind it. But are you going to bet against central banks from doing something? And the only way we'll find out is if it's 10, 10, 20% down and they go, we're not doing any more. But what's the chance of that? So you've got to kind of think this is more likely to be an air pocket, could be a big air pocket, rather than the beginning of a new bear market. But it's only the very beginnings. But that's how I'd look at it. Think of it as an air pocket first, because but you obviously have to watch it develop. So it's difficult because it's 5% when we got on air right now down on the NASDAQ, could get a lot more, could get through most people's stops and take people out of the market. And then what happens? Do we see a, do we see a, a, then a nonlinear move to the downside? So what I said to, again yesterday is that the irony of this market is the higher it, gra- the higher it goes grinding out these new highs until, get, until today, the less likely you're going to get a repeat of the fiscal and the monetary because there's no need. So right. actually, what you need to get the central banks back in play is a pullback. What's their tolerance limit? It was about 35% last time. I mean, we got down, I think they did their first move on 23rd of March, which was the low, and then some right. more on the 2nd or 3rd or 4th of April. How much will they allow this to go down, given it's an election year, they don't want to be seen to be politicized either way, which is a bit balancing act. Right. But, but they came in in March. They're not going to sit there six months later and go, you know what, we don't care this time. So you've got to assume that, that that would happen. But before we even get to that sort of mentality, you just have to think of this really as an air pocket because we had got so stretched. And as an example, the trend on the NASDAQ, if you got to 11,200, it's about 10% down from the high, but that's just the trend that we've been had in place for the last five months. That'd be normal, just pull back to the trend. So you've got to think of these as, what's the trend? Where can we pull back to? At this stage, it's an overbought 
technical air pocket in a low volume environment, but that's it can obviously go further, but you've got to assume that central banks are still central and liquidity and flow fund, flow of funds or flows is still more important than fundamentals. Talk a little bit about the flow of funds point that you made, because I know this is central to your thesis. So flow of funds is basically, yeah, there is multiple ways that the, what the central banks are doing can create effectively a credit, because central banks, they can't buy the market. They can't, they, they can only they can only lend, they can't spend. And so what they're always doing is they're putting collateral. So when they when they print the money, they put collateral into commercial banks. And those commercial banks can do a number of things. They could lend, but if they don't want to lend because they're too scared and we don't want to borrow because we we can't, we've, we're maxed out or there's nothing to borrow for, what are they going to do with it? Well, they'll probably lend it to their mates in the shadow banking system, which is the high frequency traders. And they'll start you know, using it as collateral themselves and leverage into the equity market. So there's that sort of one of the ways the hot potato sort of thing. And that's one of the drivers that we've seen through this market. The biggest problem that we have in a way is that what you want the Fed to do is get everybody to put money into productive assets. But if you're given a choice, if I gave you a million, a million quid, a million dollars, and you had a 10-year view based on where forward inflation is, which basically says there's no growth for 10 years, all we've done is rebounded from where we were. Or you could put it into asset prices, which only seem to go up. And by the way, the Fed's got your back, theoretically. You've got to carry on putting money into the into the assets. The problem with this, this is why, yeah, and this is why I think it's still deflationary, is that inflation of the assets, because you've got a bubble, if it keeps on going up, you'll divert more capital into it, and eventually it'll blow up, and that will be deflationary. So it's a really, it's really difficult. I mean, they they box themselves into a corner um, in this whole environment. And as I say, what we're seeing today is just it's a blow off top at this stage, not a blow off top, it's a blow off from the top because we got so stretched on all, all those metrics. But when we think about where we could go from here, it's, you know, it's like that scene, is it Shawshank Redemption where he's being held over the edge and he says, do you love your wife or do you love your Fed? What do you mean by that? Well, do I love my Fed? Will they do this? Will they do more? Yes, they will. Okay, we're back from the edge then. And that's kind of how I think we have to still assume it's going because the solvency story has not really kicked in the true bankruptcies the death by a thousand cuts, that is still some way down the track. Yeah. What are you going to be looking for, Roger, to understand when that accelerates, uh, on the one hand, the, 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 the actual wave of insolvency that may be coming in the future versus understanding what the, the reaction from the Fed is going to be? What are you going to be looking at as your signals to determine which path we're going in in the near term? So I'm, I'm assuming at the moment that bond yields will remain subdued by the threat of QE. Now, the interesting thing is that during most periods of QE, actual when they've been buying, bond yields have stabilized and gone higher. But then if they got too high, it'll destabilize the whole system. But that was 3.25% back in 2018. It'll be a lot lower today. But you can see that, that the particular sort of two, five, 10 year part of the curve has been very, very locked at these low levels, relatively flat levels. It's, tightened, it's, it's steepened slightly. Can the longer dated end go? But then if the longer dated end starts to move, then it becomes attractive to people again. Because if you started getting two, two and a half percent in the 10 year, you go, oh, okay, that, that's so 30 year. That, that's interesting once more. But it's that sort of thing. Will bond yields get out of, out of sync? Will bond yields do um, more than expected? Has the Fed shot its bolt? Because the Fed basically said, we're going to buy corporate bonds. So the whole market bought corporate bonds. So when the Fed eventually buys corporate bonds, they'll be buying them from everybody selling out of the bonds they bought front running the Fed. So that's net flat. That would be a dangerous position as well. At the moment, credit's been very, very well behaved. So you've got to look at credit. If credit starts to blow out, then that would be the market giving a negative signal. At the moment, it's basically saying the market's saying there's not a problem. Yeah. We saw the 30-year yield drift up a little bit, hard to say, drift up to 1.5%. Uh, <laughs> strange words to hear. Uh, and now rolling over a bit in September. Yeah, and the, the thing with these yields is that there's the threat of yield curve control. They haven't done it yet. They said they won't do it, but like we've talked about before, they always say they're not going to do the things that they do when they need to. Right. They won't do it yet. The market is doing a very good job of, of holding these yields down. Right. There's always worry, there's this worry that you know, who's going to buy them? Well, the Fed will buy them if need be. And if yields get high enough, they become attractive again because you start to get a real yield. So one of the things that um, Ed was talking about was this convergence in yields where everyone's, or the US has converged towards Europe, 
in fact, everyone's converging towards Japan is the reality of it. And right. that means that what was driving this market was the hunt for yield. And George Saravellas talked about this. Sorry, George Saravellas is a, the FX strategist at Deutsche Bank. In 2014, he coined the phrase the euro glut. Yields collapse in Europe. Everyone in Europe wants to find yield elsewhere. Their pensions, they go to the US, they go to the UK. Money goes out of Europe, pushes the euro down. Convergence of yields mean that flow is no longer there. And what Mahmoud of QI was talking about was that this is potentially means that we're now from a hunt for yield environment to a capital preservation environment. Mm. In that environment, there's less demand for dollars based on the assets in the US, apart from the equity market and a small part of that. So you can see why some of that euro weakness has been there. And it has been, euro, sorry, not euro weakness, euro strength yeah. has been there. But it has been euro strength rather than dollar weakness. Because emerging market currencies, they've done very, very little. They've been quite weak versus the dollar through this period of so-called dollar weakness. So I think right. this is the way to understand it is that you know, real yields and absolute yields have started to converge a little bit. Um, and it's taken some of the momentum out of the demand from Europeans for overseas assets. But remember that the euro really kicked off to the upside when you got that $750 billion uh, euro package agreed in July. Right. And as of yesterday, when we got to 120 on the euro, some of the European politicians are going, I'm a Newton bitter. This isn't great. We don't want this. What we need here is inflation. And if our currency goes up, we don't get it. So now what we've had is we've had central banks working together. Well, now if central banks start to move apart because the more the dollar goes down, the harder it is for Europe and Japan to hit their inflation targets. So they have to act more. Problem is Europe has run out of monetary bullets and it's just agreed its fiscal package with the, the um, frugal five kicking and screaming. How much more can Europe do? But actually, Europe, the euro goes down when Europe looks more, disun more disunity in Europe, which I think is kind of will be the next phase again. Yeah. So, Roger, you've unpacked a number of different threads there. How do you stitch it all back together? In other words, when you look at this market, thinking about all the things that have been on your mind that you've been writing about, that you've been thinking about, how do you bring it together in a way that's comprehensive and helps you understand what we're looking at? So the I think the euro dollar story is... Clearly one to watch, but it's more its more what the politicians do now, which is that do they start grinding against each other? A bit like 2014 when Europe, ECB and the Bank of Japan really took off and sort of went for it, went properly for it, because that will start to change. I think there's a lot of balancing mechanisms in here. So that's number one. Number yeah. two is I think, you know, I would expect the Fed will start jawboning, not necessarily doing anything, but jawboning if we had another three or four percent down from here. Because remember, in June, they started, when we had that 5% air pocket on the S&P, they quickly came out and reiterated their policies. They weren't new policies, but they reiterated them. So that will tell us that the framework that is driven by that central bank liquidity is still intact. Um, for me, it's going to be things like, I'm still looking at those emerging market currencies. I think that if emerging market currencies start to move down versus the dollar, I think that the euro and other currencies will also roll over as well. It hasn't happened yet. But in the equity market, the biggest threat in the equity market is that you've now got the emotional involvement that we did, didn't have in January and February. I said January and February, this is not a bubble because it's being driven by computers. Who do Bubbles are always emotional. They're always driven by people who get massively hurt when it goes wrong. Yeah. We put those people in. I don't think that they are sufficiently large enough within the overall space. There are a high percentage of the volumes over the summer relative to, let's say, history. But over, over the, in terms of the overall market ownership, I still don't think that they are there. So I still think that these are gyrations. Obviously, the election matters. Um, I think the volatility is way too high for the election at the moment. It's, it's around about 36 prior to today versus 26 with 10 points between the two. I think it's too high because it doesn't really matter who gets back in. If it's Biden, OK, it's not going to be it's at the, on day one, it's not going to be that really, really left-wing view. And if it's Trump, it's continuity. So I think that buying you know, options 10, 20 vol over realized for the election, I think is a bad idea. The election will matter, but I think it'll be much more slow burning. And, and it was interesting, back in my Deutsche Bank days, Binky Child of the strategy said, if you have a close election, you normally have flatlining markets. Obviously, this time we've been going up. Yeah. And then whoever wins, there is a relief, because now there's certainty. And markets tend to see some buying coming on the other side. This one is an uncertain one, but it's going up 
into this election until today, not sideways. So maybe it doesn't play out. But the point here is that often what matters on the election is not who wins, but whether there was pent up demand going into the election and then just a relief at knowing what the result is. And that's not taking a view on either side. It's just saying that has some history behind it. Right. There are a lot of moving parts in these in these markets, Roger. And, and thanks for bringing us that context. Final question before you leave. On a slightly lighter note, we did an interview yesterday with James Altucher, talked about some of the issues that we were early to the party on, uh, people moving out of cities, especially the tier one cities like New York and London. What were your thoughts yesterday on James's points? Um, I mean, all of them are sort of, I mean, they're just yeah, excessive views of, of our own views that we had. We talked about this in early mid-April. So this is yeah. you know, five, six months ago or four, four or five months ago. Um, and I remember the time I, I sort of said, do you remember the song Ghost Town? By yeah. The specials, which was written um, for the UK in 1981 when the inner cities of Britain were ghost towns. And I said, it's not going to become like that. But in some ways it has. I still think that there will be a, a rebalancing. And if if basically there is less demand for um, less demand from businesses and, and financial districts, then all these people are living at home because they can't get on the housing ladder. There's going to be cheaper housing coming through because there will be this rebalancing of it. But it is it has shocked me even compared to what I thought in April at how in certain markets, certain cities, I think more so in the U.S. than anywhere else, this has happened because there's been those other problems. Yes, there's been rioting and protests in other places, but not to quite the same extent. In the city of London, the financial district, it's incredibly quiet. It's still 15% of where it should be. But it's a small district that's been encroached upon by um, areas full of vibrancy. So I don't think it's going to be quite so bad. But it's still been quite shocking. I think his comments were, you know, a lot of that was to, I think he's, you know, he's got a big view and it's a sort of, you know, to get grab the headlines. But I've been surprised at how what we thought would happen has happened faster and more aggressively in some of these, particularly these heavily packed, aggressive urban centers in, in particularly the US and, the, and to a lesser extent here in the UK. Yeah, we were certainly early to the party with that view. Yeah, I think I think so. Um, you know, and, and it, from my viewpoint, it came about just because a neighbor said, oh yeah, I've got some friends who are, are looking for a house in the same area you are. I still haven't bought a house because every house I've gone for, I've been going to nine sealed bids and I've got outbid every single time. So I'm just feeling it. I'm going to have to end up having been in a brilliant cash rich position pre-COVID. I'm now five, 10 percent behind where I was and we still no house in sight. So I'm, I'm feeling it. It's happening here. People moving out. It's hitting the, the property market manically in this part of the world, 70 miles outside of London. Yeah. And I'm and I'm feeling it on the opposite end of the spectrum. I haven't waited for an elevator uh, for several months in my building. It just, you know, I walk out, the halls are empty. It's a ghost town. I'm waiting to see the tumbleweeds blow down them. Yeah, and you know it's it's shocking, and I think the numbers that uh, James put out were incredible. Particularly, I think when you think of the restaurant industry, and I think the same you know, that that hospitality industry in the city of London is equally it's not just decimated. That's one in ten. It's halved, more than halved, and yeah. it's that's the vibrancy. That was what we said, and in response to some comments, we said you know our views were stupid jack views. Mm -hmm. I said, but we'll lose the vibrancy in these areas because it's these small businesses which go out. And if the small businesses go out and you've got high property prices, who's going to live there? Yeah. Because there's nothing to, nothing, you know, no excitement. So yeah. that was the reason why I thought it would happen. Yeah. Heart and soul of the community. Um, Roger, we've just blown through another runtime uh, record here on RVDB, but it was worth it. Thanks for joining us. A lot of great content today. Thank you very, very much. Great to speak to you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks very much for your time again.